Yes. Well, even battling well, over that. Oh, I know, man. I know. I, I, I just, just everything. Everything, man. It's like two fucking kids. It is. I'm going to bash your heads together very, very soon. Sorry, Dad. Okay. He started it. Hmm. I did start it. You followed up. Stop. I've warned you both. <laughs> I'll turn this spaceship around. I swear. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, welcome back to Shonky Lev. This is part two of us talking about spaceships and utter guff. Yes. I'm joined by Mr. Lee Metcalf. Hello. And Andy Palacides. Hello. Good. Right. Okay, right. We're all back in the room again. Um, yes. One thing I've noticed on our little break that we've had, uh, I was I, I wrote down the button moose ship on my uh, notes. I've got one note, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, button moon. Mm. The one space... It. It's not actually eligible, uh, because while it is able to go to the moon, it is not interplanetary. So unfortunately, uh, under our system, it, it wouldn't be eligible. For, for your show. Oh, okay. But we're on the Shonky Lab. Oh, in that case, <laughs> it, it, it fits right in. Uh, yes, it does, yeah. <laughs> I've just noticed. Okay, I... Elton, Elton, okay, okay so, so the button moon ship. So we're going to do this, yeah? All yeah, right. we're doing oh, the so, button moon ship. Right, so, so size. W what, what are you giving it for size? Well, it, there's a mouse in it. There's a mouse. Well, okay, <laughs> We'll, we'll, look, we'll peep behind the curtain a little bit now. Now, with size on, uh, on space.jury, you've got between 1 and 15 to choose from, right? Okay. Now, if a ship is scoring 15... <laughs> um, on, let me just get this up so it's right. I think we're saying it's 50... Uh, yeah, there we go. Right. I, I, I have the matrix open here. So anything over 15 is over 100 kilometers in length, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're scoring a 10, you're about one kilometer. And then nor to nine are hundred meter increments. So whereabouts do you think the button moon ship's gonna go? Well, this is what I've just discovered about the button moon ship. Mm -hmm. Um the middle compartment of the ship is made of a baked bean can. It's a baked bean can. It's a baked bean can. I've never so, noticed uh, that. Not that I've mm, ever watched it you know, in I, the last I, twenty I think, years. I think we'll probably have to give that a zero, Lee. Would you would you say? I'd say a zero. All right, so that's a zero. Okay, so we'll give it a zero for size. Now, for speed. Well, you say zero, but zero would not exist. So there is some sort of mass zero. there. Zero to 100. I'm sure there's a meters. deck. <laughs> yeah, but zero to 100 metres is zero. 100 metres to 200 metres is one. Ah, oh, okay. But then, yes, zero. Yes. <laughs> so, speed. Now, now, speed, we break into three categories. Yep. Uh, our first is sublight speed. So how long would you think it would take for the bottom moon ship to, to cross uh, the solar system? J just roughly. Um, well, the TV show aired in 1970-odd. Mm -hmm. I, I reckon it's still going right. now. <laughs> okay, so I, I reckon then we're probably going to assume it's going to take years to get there. So that's going to give you a one for sublight. Okay, um, I'm on the now, board. Now, now for FTL... Oh. FTL. Um, I'm on France. the board it's, with Button Moonship. I don't it's care. It's not wobbly wobbly timey wimey. No, you're not. It's else. not <laughs> instantaneous jumps. It's not limited uh, instantaneous jumps. It's not jump gates. It's not warp. In fact, I don't think it has any FTL. Does it? Does Does it go faster than light? I don't think it does. I, no, no, I don't think it does. Only okay. only due to the fact that uh, one of their crews appeared to be a man with spoons for arms. Mm. <laughs> we'll, we'll come to that uh, when we get to crew, but for the moment, um, <laughs> so so for FTL we'll give it a zero. Uh, now maneuverability, now, now a chance to score back some points here. Uh, this is between one and five. Now if you're scoring five, you're really maneuverable, like a white star or like a super maneuverable fighter. And if it's one, uh, a flying brick. Now uh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I'm guessing we're talking a flying brick. Um. I reckon it's more manoeuvrable like a London cab. That That's still flying brick region. That's still a one. To be honest. Yeah. Um, though point of order. Yes. Um, just, just to bring this up. Uh, on the chat, Brian mm. has said that button moonship makes it to the moon from Earth in a couple of minutes. And that's mm. bloody fast. Oh, that is. So, so we might, have, so to might have to revise the sublight speed. Um, to two. To two. Mm, well, yeah, I'm happy to say that, yeah. Because hmm. as we know, space is big. No, no, it's really big. I mean, you might think going down to your shops is a long way, but that's nothing compared to space. So wow. we'll give it two for sublight. Okay. Now, firepower. There you go. <laughs> right. 
Now, again, we have a range of 15 here. If you score story 15 uh, for firepower, you have the ability to destroy stars and entire solar systems uh-huh. with a single shot. Uh, at 10, you can destroy a capital ship with a single shot. Um, at 1, you have like armed support craft like Starbug. So where do we think the, uh, the button moon ship's going to come on firepower? Well, okay, I, I have been thinking about this, and um, I think the fire, all the firepower would probably come from one of their um, crewmates. You, you have the family of Mr. Spoon and mm-hmm. his wife, yeah. and, and their daughter and son, who is an egg, I think. Okay. And I do I, believe... What was, was the milkman also an egg? Uh, a chicken, perhaps. I'm, I'm just saying, there's a conversation to be had there. The the uh, the, the the boy here, mm-hmm. I do believe he has bouts of Tourette's, okay. and so that could be classed as the firepower. I, I, unfortunately, no, because because I, I I I think that's more of a marine compliment, if you will. So again, that comes under crew. So I think we're going to have to give it zero for firepower. I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, I was going for a two at least. Oh, no, you see a two, no. you're talking fighters, you know, things like X-Wings and so an forth. X-wing, an X-Wing versus the button moon ship. Yeah, Would I'd you... like to see that. Mm. I, I, I think it'd probably just run it over. Um, <laughs> back, on the, back, on the, back on the chat, yes. um, Jim's decided to wade in, and he says, yes. actually, the button moon ship doesn't just travel from the Earth to the moon. It's travelling from the junk planet across the blanket sky to button moon. <laughs> well, well, can Jim give me the distances involved here? I mean, come on now, I need some facts. I need statistics, damn it. Well, how many miles is this? He said that's uh, 238,900 miles. Well, that's well moved. And Jim's saying it's a different planet altogether. Mm. So, I, mean, I mean, give me stuff to work with here, people. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. We'll keep it this moving. Yeah. We'll keep and, this moving. and Doreen thinks that the button moon ship has the ability to fire cold baked beans. Well, no, it's empty because they're living inside it. So where's it storing the ammo? Think about this, people. Think in the, about in it. the funnel on top. Unless you can show me some on-screen evidence, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to assume it doesn't. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Is, is that roll so, of sellotape for the boosters? I'm not too sure. <laughs> we're on to defence now. Defence. Now, now defence is split into three categories, active, passive, and special. Now, active defence, if it's a very manoeuvrable ship, can move out of a way of bullets or anything like that, or if it has, like, uh, point defence weapons. Um, does it have any kind of active defence at all? It can run away, and I, if that bottom roll is a roll of sellotape, then maybe it could put the sellotape screen up, which it is very famous for. Is it? Or maybe Mr. Spoon could throw one of his wellies out. He throws a wellie out, is he? <laughs> As um, a diversionary tactic. You, you might be able to plead that under special, which we'll come to in a minute. But Very special. I think we're going to have to give it a zero for active defence. Oh, now, nuts. passive defence. Um, oh, oh, hold on, hold on, yeah. hold on, hold on. Ooh. Point from the Mixler chat. Yes. Just pointed out that Mr. Spoon helps with a pair of scissors which have accidentally at times cut the thread holding button moon to the blanket sky. <laughs> wow, Ooh, that, that could almost be planet-destroying, couldn't that's it? That's almost planet-destroying. I think that that's, is. that's pretty fucking hefty, actually. So, sh- I'll tell you what, then, you know, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll give that a 15. We'll no, no, that... 14. We're 14. That's, that's one shot destroying a planet, that is. So yep. 14 for five. But you're 15 points now, Elton. See? No, no, 17. 17? 17 points, I'm keeping the track oh, of you're it. Give, are you giving it to... Oh, so 17. Well, you, you're doing all right. You're, do, you're doing better than the X-Bomber. That, that's good <laughs> enough for me. I, I, I wish you were, but that's just not true, unfortunately. That thing won't die. But anyway, so passive defense. Um, now, five <laughs> is if you have perfect shields, you know, you know, you just can't get through those things at all. Sellotase. Um, three is shit shields. Zero is tinfoil, effectively. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm leaning towards <laughs> tinfoil, if I'm honest. Uh, well... It is a baked bean can. Well, it's a little bit common tinfoil, but one is low-level armour. I don't think you can really argue that a baked bean can is armour. It's corrugated. Mm, uh, Lee, Lee, give me a ruling here. What do you think? I, I reckon you could you could argue baked bean cans as armour. Yeah. How effective you get it? I don't know. I'd, I'd give it a one. All right. We'll give you the one. We'll give you the one for a passive uh, defense. Now we're into special, so this is where your sellotape shields could come in. Okay. Has it got anything like a cloaking device or regeneration or wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff that you know potentially, you know, could help you in a jam? If if the man who's holding the string, which is holding the button moon <laughs> ship, mm-hmm. 
passes in between the ship and the light that is shining on it, mm -hmm. it disappears into his shadow. Cloaking device. Oh, oh that's easily worth a one. There you go. There you go. So we'll give you one for special. Right. Look at me. I'm on fire with button moons. Right. So now, realisation, okay? How well realised is the exterior of the button moon ship? How well? Wait, it, five. It, it's made of kitchen material. It, it, it is somewhat made of kitchen material, but you could I'm argue that that is the point. Unfortunately, it's only out of five one, for the exterior. Five. You can have it at one to five. So five. Just to give you an idea, five... Is top of the line Star Wars special effects. Mm -hmm. Number one is basically. I think number one actually is is a couple of baked bean cans and a funnel stuck together. It is. It is the spaceship from Star Crash. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it is. It is Blue Peter, Tracy Island. I'd be happy with a three. I'm sure you, you would be happy with a three, <laughs> but it's not happening. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to give you one for exterior realisation, I'm afraid. I'll get, give it one just for holding together. Nowadays, yeah. it would be made with Tipex bottles as well, but unfortunately, it Tipex nowadays. wasn't it was made. in the 70s, so yeah. you're stuck with what you're stuck with. Yeah, though, um, Brian, Brian, has, um, Brian has pointed out, um, no offence to Elton, but this is sounding like a special edition of Space Dock Jury. <laughs> and forget the <laughs> um, and Jack Woodgate would like to ask: Do we can we see where the bridge is? Oh, we're getting to that because now we're up to interior realization. You see, What's... now I've got to say uh, this does suffer a little bit from TARDIS syndrome. Is it does appear to be bigger on the inside, and there's not a huge amount of correlation between what you see inside the ship and the outside. So I'm probably going to have to give it one again here for the interior realization. I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm afraid. I I, I agree. It's not yeah. great. But it is it's... clean inside. The baked bean tin has been cleaned. There are is no it... burrs on the hole that has been cut for Mr. Spoon to put his head out of. <laughs> so he's in, in no danger of hurting himself whatsoever. That's, that's, that's why we're giving you the one. <laughs> yeah. Just be glad we're giving you the one. Yeah. We could Not... give you nothing. <laughs> now, now here, here's, here's a chance for you to really score some points, though, Elton. Okay. Be on your mind. Now we come to the science. How well does the science stack up okay. for Button Moonship? Now, if it's scoring a five... We call it Tyson proof. In that Neil deGrasse Tyson himself, the biggest troll. I'll stop you there. Science fiction. I'll stop you there. Yeah. yeah. I'm going for five. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Let's hear. Let's hear the reasoning. Come on. Come, come at me, Elton. Come at me. <laughs> um. Oh God. Come on. You got. You can't just save a number. You got to defend it. Yeah. Um. How do I turn this mic off? I don't know. I don't know. But I. All I know is I. I took. He's I been took. Trying for five episodes. It. It, it, it can't. I took I took some sulpidine um, earlier on, and I think it may have gone off because this conversation I can hear in my ears is dr it just sounds very surreal. You wait until we get to crew. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming up after this. Episode. Come on, what are you going for? Science. science. How well does the science stack up for the Button Moon ship? And well, in the audience, please, in Mixler, how well hmm? do you think the science matches up in uh, the Button Moon ship? I, I think it flies just as well as a baked bean can with a funnel and a roll of sellotape on its bottom would. Mm. And I think it's how you would... If Neil deGrasse Tyson um, had a baked bean can, put a funnel on the top and built this with his mm. children, it would fly exactly how it does on the uh, show. I'm, I, I'll tell you what, right? I, I'm going to give you one. And, and do you know why I'm going to give you the one? Because you have because... to make this go faster. No, no, it's because that's what we gave the X bomber, and the effects in Button Moon are better than the effects in Starfleet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is very. So true. you can have your one for that, because um, yeah, this uh, is close to actually appearing on the, on our wall. It, it, yeah. it is kind of disturbing. Well, we're up to crew now. So now for crew, we split into two categories. <laughs> right, I'm gonna. The put... First one is how many crew members you have now. What? At ten, you have twenty thousand plus. And then you go all the way down to, you know, at five, you've got 250 to 1,000 crew members, and one is between one and five. So, so whereabouts on that scale would you like to go for Button Moon? Well, I've just put a picture in the chat mm -hmm. of what I am classing as the crew. Now, bearing in mind, this crew does... Uh, uh, It's still better than Starfleet. Wait, 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 wait. We're getting there. Uh, it does have a man with wooden spoons for arms and welly boots on. Yeah. That is the dad. There is a a, a daughter made of a shampoo bottle, I think. Uh, a mum made of a toilet brush 
with also spoons for arms. And are, are, are you judging her? Because that sounded very judgmental. Get this. I, I mean, get this. Please. There is a teddy bear <laughs> with a wand. There's a teddy bear in red dungarees, I do believe. Now, I, I, the choice sure... of space flight. I, I'm, I'm hoping Jim and Brian will back me up on this, but I believe only three of those are actually crew members of the Button Moon ship. The others are actually inhabitants of the moon. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm afraid if you go to the right-hand side of the picture and mm-hmm. you can see a man made from a milk bottle carton and he has a little son. I do believe the son once appeared on the ship itself. Oh, but passengers do not count as crew. We've, we've, we've recently had this discussion that you, you've got to be actually part of the crew, not just a passenger. So, By the way, can I ask a question? Of course. The son of the milk bottle man. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is he um, mummy's special toy that the kids aren't allowed to play with? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a picture of him right here. Hang on. Let me just... Um, uh... Oh, dear God, please let us not be in situ. <laughs> Hang on, and Summers. <laughs> in Thai um, Omega Craft again. Um, Jim, Jim says uh, he believes the chaps are Captain Large and the Bottle Army who live on Button Moon. So, mm. See, in the picture that I've put in the chat, you do yeah. have the sun, and he does have a red bobble hat. That, that's an egg. That's, that's completely different to it, the... He is um... an egg and an egg, egg cup. And you can see interior there. You can see it's exterior. It's amazing. I, I, we, we were very generous with that one, uh, as you can see. Oh, give over. Look at it. It's amazing. <laughs> right. But it really doesn't fit inside the other ship. Shush. Because, look, if you look, at, if you look at Mr. Spoon... Wait, wait. Are, are, are you saying, Lee, are you saying that Mr. Spoon is a Time Lord? I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm saying that this may not be the most well thought out spaceship ever ever created. I'll be honest. I've just noticed that Mister Spoon's hat is an actual uh, a plastic bowl turned over on its head. I've never okay. noticed that. So, okay. any- <laughs> <laughs> all right. Again, getting back to the scoring. Back to the scoring. So, okay. so how, how many? How one. many crew members? So, so I'm are, saying you've got four at most. Four, four at most. Yeah. So that's a one. You've got one for crew number. Right. Now you come to crew competency. And strangely enough, I somehow think you might score well here. Ah, ah, ah. How competent are the crew of a Button Moon spaceship? I think they are very competent. Uh, what, 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 what is the scale of... of right, the scale is between one and five. At right. five. And, and I think we need to change this as well. But five, as it currently stands, is your legendary Starfleet crew. You know, they, they, they can do no wrong. Okay, right. Uh, I... You go all the way down to zero which is the crew of a Red Dwarf. I'm going for four because oh they God. always get to Button Moon. You know what? I'm going to give you that four for that very reason. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, two, two, uh, two. Firstly, they make it to Button Moon in that thing. And secondly, they managed to fly a baked bean can, a smaller can, and a funnel to Button Moon. I mean, that alone. That's and, a fair. I'm and happy back. To give yeah, and they make. I mean, let's face it, getting there's only half a story, you know. Mm. So okay, so now we're coolness, right? We're cool factor now. Now we all now me, Lee, and yourself get to to take part in here. So what happens now is you have four points to award it for how cool you think it is, and me and Lee each have three, and this tots up to a total of ten. So Elton, how cool do you think <laughs> the Batman is out of one to four? One to four. Okay, I. Uh... I would go. I would go a two. You're only giving it two. You, you can give it all four of your points if you want. I mean, because it it adds up to ten in total. So so. You, no, say... I'm. I'm happy with myself going for a two because it hasn't got an orange cone or funnel on the top. It has gone for the the um the white one. Right. Um. Also, the but it is a Heinz baked bean can. It does have the label on there. Yes, and which I never noticed before, and um. Heinz are pretty much the best, so they they are flying in good stuff. So I'd I'd say I'm going for a two. I I'm pretty confident I will get my two. Oh no, you you have your two. You can award it as many as you want. You get those points. No, we won't I'm, argue with you about it. That's okay. The thing. I'm, cool. I'm happy with subjective thing. I'm happy with two. You happy with two? So Lee, yeah. how many points would you like to uh, award it? Fuck all. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got to give so, it one. You have got to give it at least one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm giving it one. It does I'm have go faster stripes. It, okay. it does. Uh, 
Now, I, I would, if possible, like to take points away from it um, for bringing this in, but I can't, <laughs> as he mentioned. So I too will have to give it one. I'll give it one point. Sweet. So we don't have Peter here to make sure it's I, right. I but... have been, I have been t- totting up the scores and totting up the it's, scores. It's terrifying, actually. <laughs> it, it. I, I think we might need to go away and think these scores up again. So we're we going to have to do another revision here. Um, right, so, so the button moonship. <laughs> What well, did it score? Well, at the moment, Thunderbird 3 is at the bottom of our table at the moment with 32 points. Right. The Button Moonship has 31. <laughs> <laughs> frankly, oh, if I'd gone for four, I would have beaten it. If I'd gone for four, you would have beaten the Thunderbird 3 and the Eagle Transporter. Which were both Lee's ships. <laughs> both my ships have been beaten by an inadmissible button moon tin can with a fun <laughs> the fucking top. Uh, well, yeah. So, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The button moon ship. Uh, it's only two points less good than Thunderbird Three. You heard it here first. If it had actually made it onto the board, I think you'd have to revise everything. Oh, no. <laughs> I won't, tell you, I won't tell you where on the scoreboard now Thunderbird 3 and the Eagle Transporter currently sit mm. because that would give it away for an episode that's coming up. But yeah. suffice to say, we've got a few ships in front of it now. <laughs> One or two, yes. <laughs> One or two. Oh, God. I'm, I'm actually going to make a note of that on our spreadsheet. I, 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 think, I think, well, yeah, I, I think we probably should uh, ha- have an honourable mention there. <laughs> Yeah, 31 points. <laughs> Fuck my boots. Well, uh, t- to be fair, I mean, a lot of that did hinge on its planet-destroying capabilities. So, I mean... Um... Yeah, curse you, Jim. Yes. Where you are now, I'm cursing you. Cause... Well, hell's heart, we stab at V. Because <laughs> he managed to give it 14 points straight out of the gate just with a pair of fucking scissors. Mm. <laughs> thank, uh, you, thank you, Jim. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, so, That's the end of that podcast. Let's talk about something else. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> what have you guys eaten on the train, or seen people eating on the train? <laughs> um, Andy. Um, uh, well, uh, shall I tell you where I've got this idea from first? Yeah, yeah. Oh, please do. Yeah. Please do. Okay. Well, I was reminded. Um, uh, Amanda bought some Viennetta the other day, mm. and uh, the, I don't like ice cream, so I just I don't end up having my share or anything like that so the kids were sitting there eating it and they get all excited when they find out that vns is in the house and oh my god we gotta have some of that end up cutting it and it reminded me uh 1995 i was off uh i was traveling to uh my first concert ever i was going to go see blur at wembley arena and i was uh with amanda and seven or eight other friends Mm -hmm. And we got to Woolwich Arsenal Station, and was it Woolwich Arsenal Station? I might not have even been there, but I I know yeah we got up to Woolwich Arsenal, and then we had to go somewhere. We went up to London, and uh, we ended up getting a, a KFC, mm. and we bought a massive thing because there was six or seven of us. We got the buckets and stuff like that, and it was at the time where you got your free big bottle, two liter bottle of Pepsi or whatever it was. Mm. And for some bizarre reason, you ended up with a Viennetta. As you do. Exactly. And us lot not being wanting to waste any food, we took the Viennetta. Mm. And <laughs> and there was seven, maybe six or seven people with these uh, KFC spoons and forks and stuff like that, carefully cutting Viennetta on a train. <laughs> <laughs> Is this where your erotic love of the Viennettas come in? Because <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I do have, <laughs> I do have a re- recollection of you getting quite excited about Viennetta and cracking the chocolate on the top. I I don't like Viennetta. I don't like ice cream. What? I, I, what are you? Some kind of monster? No, I don't. He's a I pod person. Do... He's a pod person. No, I, I, I don't do ice cream. I don't do jelly or ice cream. I was the saddest kid at parties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, might do. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't actually partake in this, but I was part of the group that had the, the KFC and all, all the drinks and stuff like that. And 
eating your your baked beans out of your little pot. And uh, yeah, once you got rid of all the baked bean juice, then you the people attacked the Vianetta. So yeah, bonkers. Oh right. Um. Wow. I I just eating baked beans out of a pot is wrong though, isn't it? I mean seriously. It was. Mm. Let me guess. Were they cold? I don't mind cold baked beans. I've got no problems in that at all. I oh. can eat, I can eat them straight from the can. Mr. Butter Moon can, actually. Yeah. No, we, let's not go back there. No, let's not do that. Um, Hold on. So, I mean, because, like, eating cold baked beans out of a can. Oh, oh, Carol's going, I do that. Oh, that's nice. There you go. Yeah, okay. So you're both sick. What's, what's that proof? <laughs> proof nothing. No, 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 no. What you do is you, you have your, you open your can. You just before you about to pour it into the saucepan, you grab your fork, take a little scoop, just to make sure you know they're all right. And what if they're not all right? Yeah, take another scoop, make sure that one's all right. Oh, it's all right. You're still going to eat it. You're still going to heat it up and eat it. It's like cold <laughs> custard. There's no point in that either. I don't get it. Oh God, no. Well, exactly, exactly. Oh, Frog Stomper, who's on there now, says, not bad for a baked bean can. I eat baked beans out of a can. There you go. I uh, see. And, 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 and there's a, a Lee Medcalf on the chat says, Thunderbird 3 got 32, for fuck's sakes. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, To which all I can say is, well, thank God for that cloaking device it had. <laughs> yeah, shut up. Don't start that. <laughs> okay, um, so anyone in the chat room, do you eat baked beans out of a can? Or have no, you? I can't stand oh. baked beans. What's the point in eating baked beans out of a can? I don't get it. No, you wouldn't we... have a meal like that. It's... Well, look, have you never gone on like a, a survival camping trip where you have to cook your baked beans? Oh, Jim eats baked beans out of a can. Of there course. you go. It's just this just proves that this just proves that there's there's, there's clearly a Venn diagram with, <laughs> with with these kind of people who eat baked beans out of a can and 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 right minded thinking people. I just like how Elton seems to equate Bell Grylls and survival uh, and cans of beans. I, I don't think you find them growing wild in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, now listen, as I now I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this baked bean tin down. Um. Oh, oh my God, Doreen's now saying she doesn't eat baked beans out of a can, but she does like cold custard. Jack says, "What's I, wrong with you people?" <laughs> Jack says, "I once had a girlfriend who told me off for eating peanut butter out of the jar." Oh, no, see, now she's wrong. That's just wrong. Well, yeah, I hope you kicked her to the curb. Yeah, well, obviously, once had a girlfriend. See, see, Jack made the right decision there. <laughs> Especially if it's crusty, 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 um, chippy bits of peanut in, in there. You can, oh, you can get that out of the crunchy peanut. Oh, <laughs> anyway, um, mm. we're talking about food on the train. Oh, are, right. Are you the man that has egg sandwiches on there? No, no, I tell you, I've, I've, a lot of times when I've eaten stuff on the train, because normally one of my one of my old hates, pet hates when I used to work at Cartoon and I had my Cartoon Beardy Twitter account was that I, there would be people eating the most disgusting shit on my train into work. And I never really felt very, very, I always felt queasy going into work because I'd always have to walk past Chinatown and, and cold, the smell of cold Chinese at eight o'clock in the morning was never really a particularly appetizing thing any ever, anyway. So so going from a train full of people eating prawn sandwiches or whatever at fucking eight o'clock in the morning would just drive me nuts. But I have been known to eat some strange stuff on the on a train on the way home, which is basically because normally when I'm doing that, I'm usually pretty drunk. Mm -hmm. But on the one the one time I wasn't was I was working at Cartoon really, really, really late. And there was, and basically, me and this this other artist who we were working on this, we were working on this project, really late, and we decided to get a pizza. And I sort of got the pizza, and we ordered it, and it was from Pizza Hut round, oh no, Pizza Express from around the corner. And by the time it was ready and delivered, because it was stupidly late and they were shutting up and what have you, by the time it got delivered, we'd actually finished the job, and I was going home, and I'm like, well, I'm not wasting this. No way am I wasting this. So I had the big old box of pizza, a 12-inch pizza. <laughs> and it, was a Di it was a Diavolo pizza. And I carried it all the way to the train station. And I sat on the train and I sort of opened up the box. I'm like, I'm so hungry. I know it's going to be not as hot as it could have been. It's going to be a bit cold. 
because I've been walking back to the station with this thing in my, under my arm. I opened it up. It was all stuck to the interior of the box, first off, because I've obviously been walking around and it's all melted cheese and stuck to the interior of the box. So I've literally ripped this thing in half. And then on top of that, I'm so I'm picking all the cheese off the in, off the top of the box. But not only that, I suddenly realized that unlike Pizza Hut pizzas, uh, Pizza Express don't actually cut their pizzas up into slices. So I literally had to eat this thing without cutlery, without it being sliced up into pizza slices <laughs> on the train in, in out of the box. And I literally, I got it and I was so hungry at like fucking one o'clock in the morning. I literally took this pizza and I folded it into a quarter. Oh, God. And so I had this massive, like, sort of five inch thick pizza sandwich. You didn't go from crust to crust like one big slice. No, 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 I literally, I just literally, because it had already been torn to pieces, so I literally just folded it in half, then folded it in half again, so it looked like one big double thick pizza slice, and I just ate it like that on the shoved train. Shoved it in your face. Shoved it in my face. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, it was lovely, though, and it was a Diavolo, so it's really spicy, super hot. Mm. Yeah, and and obviously I got a double hit of that as well. So I'm, I'm all my eyes were watering. <laughs> I've got my mouth on fire. I'm sitting there on a train with a with a with a pizza as thick as a hamburger, nice. it into quarters, just stuffed in my face. <laughs> so that was that was my that was one of them. I've got I've got a list, but I'll I'll leave them because I don't want to just just leave it all all down because the other ones are when I was drunk. But uh, there you go. So I'll leave that one. I'll let, let Andy go next. Yeah, go on, Andy. Have you got anything? Or, or uh, well, you... it's 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 not quite as impressive as the five folded pizza, as it were. Um, <laughs> again, uh, be, being a Londoner who has to use the tube fairly frequently, I do try and avoid eating on the underground wherever possible. Um, but I do have one story about trying to eat on a train. Uh, I have to take you back into a mists of time to 1995, I think it was, mm. uh, and. Uh, you're going to be on a school trip, aren't you? Uh, uh, worse than that, I was, I was in the Air Cadets uh, when I was younger. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and I was up in uh, deepest, darkest Scotland. Um, and we'd be on a camp at one of the RAF bases, as you do. Uh, and I might have accidentally suffered a compound fracture of my arm um, on the last day of the camp, which was mm. fun. So, uh, again, we're up in Inverness, and it's like it's the last day of the camp, and my arm has a 90-degree bend in the middle of it where it shouldn't have. And it's like, well... Do I stay up in the hospital in Scotland um, and, you know, just make everyone come up to me and then have to get down all this? Or do we just get the train to go down to London? Uh, and, and again, I, I was I think I was about 13 and a half at the time and I have no say in this. And they all decided it would be a much better idea to take me on the train with a broken arm uh, and mm -hmm. still quite a bit of shock. So anyway, I'm on the train with my broken arm in half of a car sort of thing. I'm pretty out of it because I've got some pretty heavy duty painkillers and I've got not a clue what's going on. Um, mm. And then I decide I'm quite hungry. So um, fight my way through the train with my arm in a sling. And, you know, it, it, I don't know if anyone's ever broken an arm, but, you know, it's, it's an unusual thing to have a big cast on your arm. You know, it's this big bulky thing. You've got no movement or anything. Fight my way to the, um, the dining car on the train and order myself a burger, which for some reason I thought would be good. But this is British Rail we're talking about here, so... It was many things. Good was not one of them. And I brought my sloppy microwaved burger back to my um, table to uh, to try and do it. And, and then discovered for the first time, if, if you don't have access to both of your arms, which you are used to having, everything becomes really difficult, especially <laughs> if it's your right. I mean, I was right handed and I just broke in my right hand. It, mm. It's very difficult to do things like unwrapping um, a burger, you know, just to wrap a sort of thing. And, and so I had to get someone to help me do that slightly embarrassing and then i'm trying to eat it and again it's just like it is so incredibly difficult to eat a very soggy uh, british rail burger on a moving train with a broken arm uh, literally ended up with more of it on me than on anyone else uh, i'm sure everyone around me was quite disgusted by it but like i said i was off me not on painkillers and I had a broken arm i didn't really give a huge amount of a shit uh, but <laughs> yes uh, that, that was uh, that was my probably first and last well, in all honesty, that was probably the last time I ate anything off of a um, train buffet cart. <laughs> yeah, it was just not good. Oh, so, yes, um, that, that, that is a, a British whale burger that I had on a um, 
on a, on a train with a broken arm. So yes, fun times. Uh, to be fair, the reason I remember that story is probably more to do with the trauma of a broken arm than how bad the burger was. And I'm mm. sure they've improved since then. But yeah, ah. I, I I wouldn't bet against it. <laughs> it's very true, actually. Yeah, but yeah, like I said, uh, I I generally not only do I dislike eating on the trains, I dislike other people eating on the trains. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind. I mean, people do eat on the trains, you know, as you know, that, that happens. The only time I don't like it when it's like something really super smelly. Yeah. I mean. I mean, it's like, like I say, there, there was one guy who, if I got in the carriage with him, I would actively sort of like, especially at Grove Park, I would, I would actively sort of, if I had the chance at the next stop, and literally jump off and go down like the carriage and then jump on the next one. Oh yeah, because uh, this guy would literally he'd be bringing in his his curry from the night before, and then just decide he was hungry enough to open it up and just trough in, <laughs> and. And you know he did it every bloody day. It was you know, I just think he must have had a bowel prolapse at some point. He just suddenly stopped appearing, and then he just I I just was like, oh my god, what are you doing? He opened up one one. He opened up, and it looked like he had a tin. And I thought, oh, maybe he's got biscuits or something. And he opened it up, and he had in it he had a burger, and it was like you've got a burger in like a you know like a quality street tin and he's opened it up and it's like this flat dead looking old burger and it's obviously like that's from the day before oh god and he's like what and the smell that came off this thing i think he must have actually cooked one of his pets and just stuffed it in his <laughs> bun and it was just like i it, you it wasn't one of these things where you know when sometimes people like can put up with the smell of a mcdonald's or whatever it was actually one of these things where it's so bad, people actually started opening windows and stuff. And this guy was just happily munching away on this thing, and he's like got this greasy old fat-driven burger that's been sitting in this fucking quality street tin. He finished it. God bless him. He finished it. I think he finished everyone else off. But fucking hell, he used to do so much. Mm. Oh, disgusting. But I mean, as Another one that I've done um, was when uh, sort of one of the last couple of weeks at Cartoon and there was a guy um, there called Dan Ralph and he'd come back from a holiday in South America and one of the things he brought back was this little teeny, teeny, tiny I mean it was literally like one of these sort of jam pots that you get sort of from, from hotels that people nick off the buffet cart but it was filled with jalapeno, oh, sorry, no, habanero chili paste. And it came with these little tiny, like a little pot full of like, um, how can I put it, like like toothpicks. And so what you would do is you was, the idea was this habanero chili was so strong. You, all you do is you dap in, dip in your little toothpick and then you'd wipe it on your food. That was kind of like the serving suggestion. I turned into a burning ring of fire. Woo! And, um... <laughs> And so what happened was, um, you know, sort of one of the sort of last days we were going for a sort of going for a drink and everything and sort of lamenting what was going on. And Dan basically gave me this little tiny pot. And I don't know how to best put this, but basically what happened was I, I was trying to sort of brazen it out. So I took I, I sort of literally took one of the toothpicks out and I stuck it out, stuck it in there, got a little bit on the end of my tongue and I just went dip like that and everyone went, wow, you, you know, I can't even eat that. And there's another guy called Celso going, oh, I can't stand you. These. And I'm sort of trying to brass it out going, oh, yeah, that's fine. But what was actually happening was my entire face was going numb. Mm. And But what happened was I got this kind of really smoky paprika taste afterwards. And I thought, you know what, that's really nice. So I had another little dab and another little dab and then sort of drinks carried on and, you know, things got more and more out of outlandish as they tend to do on these kind of things. And next thing I know, I remember sitting on this train and I've got, I'm down to like two toothpicks. I mean, I've literally been dabbing this thing and sort of like burning my face off, but with this lovely smoky paprika taste in my mouth. So I was sitting there doing that. 
And this guy's like, there's this, there's this guy who was sitting across from me drunk. And he's like, what is that, mate? You're eating with a toothpick. And I went, oh, it's a habanero chili paste. And he's like, oh, give, it, give, us, give us a go. Give us a go. So I gave him this, this toothpick. And he literally just dabbed it in, stipped it on the end of his tongue, and promptly threw up all over the interior of the of the of the train. Oh jeez! And it was like whoa, carrots and then, everywhere. Yeah, it was. <laughs> he was like he was he just he was in a bad way because he was not he was clearly not prepared for how very 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 strong that chili was. <laughs> And I'm sitting there like, oh, because I'm like, you know, my face is all like fucking numb and burning, and I'm like, I'm like drunk, and it was just, it must have looked like the most disgusting comical thing ever. There's just this drunk bloke offering a tiny toothpick to a man who immediately throws up mm. everywhere. Luckily, I got off the next stop, so I didn't have to deal with it. Oh, that's gross, mm. utterly gross. Well, you see, asked. No, no, no <laughs> see. I'm not a fan of eggs either, as as you probably already know anyway. Um, mm. And I remember a school field trip. We went mm. up to London. It it might even be a Natural History Museum or Horniman's Museum. Mm. And we we all walked up in our little single file before we all had like little flashy coats that you can see, like the reflective coats. They weren't mm. invented then for little children. Um no. But, you know, two by two up to Falkenwood Station. Mm. And it was on, uh, the, I can't even remember the service now, but the trains were still the slam door trains. Oh, yeah. And so you've got the slam door and then you've got windows as well. Mm. And I was sat down and uh, I think it was, it was a girl. I think her name was Victoria. I think mm. it was Victoria. And she got out her lunchbox and she had the, uh, egg sandwiches like the the boiled egg sandwiches and we oh. all know what they smell like yeah and as soon as you crack one of them open in a, a train carriage it fills it immediately Ugh. every nook and cranny on that train is filled with egg and yeah. so i spent pretty much all of my journey from falcowood up to london uh with my head out of the window which Ugh. in the 80s 90s i think it was uh frowned upon but you were still allowed to but there was always them rumors that people would lose their heads if they stuck their head out the window <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that was just i don't i don't get i don't get egg sandwiches that's just especially especially those kind of boiled egg ones where it's all just chopped up solid egg white with bits of yellow shit in it but they know they know they're going to open an egg sandwich, they know what's going to happen. They know what's going to happen to the people around them. Yeah. Why do it? Because they're selfish assholes, mm. or, or they think everyone loves it. I mean, it's like, it's like, you know, I've seen people, I've seen people sort of eating fish and chips, and that's bad enough because, like, chips smell okay, but there's always that danger that the fish that they've got is like, is like not, not, is like fishy fish, you know, like, like rock and, um, you know, herring or you know something stupid like that, and it's just like you know, as soon as you start eating shit like that, it's just gonna fill the bloody carriage with smells. <laughs> I just, I don't, yeah, I don't get why they're doing it other than to be selfish assholes. Because I mean, you can eat anything. You could have a bloody Snickers if you're hungry. Yeah. Don't, don't, just don't start eating a full blown fish curry on the bloody train. Although on the the last train I caught, it was with uh, uh, mm -hmm. Darren and Laura on the way back home from her birthday bash. Mm. And I was the guy who, I just had the five guys. Yeah. And I, I, did I still have chips? I, th I think I was still eating the chips and I had the spicy chips. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was that guy just eating the spicy chips and yeah. just sat there for the next hour just licking my fingers on the train. Yeah, but spicy, <laughs> spicy chips is one thing. Just you know, I mean, there are other, there are things which you just don't eat. I mean, bloody egg salad sandwiches is just mm. wrong. Egg, eggy crisp sandwiches. I wonder if children still have them for school pack lunch. Because mm. yeah. my kids don't. Definitely don't. 
No. Are they still allowed to take in packed lunches? I thought with all the peanut allergies and everything now, you weren't allowed to take in any food or anything. No, you can take it in, but you just, yeah, the, the schools ask very very politely that you don't bring in anything that could be, a, you know, cause an allergic reaction. So you aren't allowed peanut butter sandwiches, that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, Jack Woodgate on the on Mixler has just come up and said, um, regards to eating out of a can, a mate of mine opens a can of tuna, opens a can of sweet corn, mixes one into the other and then just eats it like that. What, like a fruit corner? I guess so. <laughs> I mean, oh, dear. That's, that's like, that's like, make your own sick and then eat it. I mean, it's just like, that's just like storing it up like a, like a gerbil or something. You just like, oh, I want something that smells like old pants, very watery, and I want to put the sweet corn in there. It's like you're actually guaranteeing your your sick outtake is going to look a certain way, isn't it? It's but like yeah. eating, eating crayons and hoping you're going to puke a rainbow. Oh, God. Um, yeah, like putting <laughs> cereal and then put pouring milk into your mouth. Oh, Oh yeah. dear. What's the matter with these people? Yeah, though I will tell you, um, on a complete tangent, nothing to do with trains. One thing I did do once when I was quite young was I noticed that when I ate things like sugar puffs or or uh, cornflakes with a really tangy sort of no 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 it wasn't that was it it was tea when I had tea and it was really strong you get this really weird tang in your mouth mm-hmm. and it was like that's really I really like that tangy taste and I then noticed that it was the same tangy taste that you have when you have like really sweet from concentrate. Um, orange juice, you know, orange, you know, proper fresh orange juice. And what I did one day in a, in a foodie sort of Heston Blumenthal style experiment like 20 years before was I got a really strong cup of tea, but instead, and then I put in the milk, but instead of just putting in any sugar, I took a big glug of fresh orange juice and threw it in the tea. Mm-hmm. Guess what happened? It all came back out. Or all the all the all the all the milk in the tea curdled, turned into like seven hundred little stringy bits. Like you know, like sometimes when you have tissue paper in your pockets and you put it in a tumble dryer. Oh, that's like having uh, Bailey's and lime cordial, isn't it? Yeah, and it all just turned into this stringy, the stringy shit, and all the tea itself was just sitting underneath. And like a fool, I drank it, and unsurprisingly, I was very very sick. Oh dear. But I did have that tangy taste. It lasted longer and it made sense. Science. That's science. what that is. See? That's what it's all about. Science. Speaking of science, since that we've only got yes, uh, uh, 12 minutes left of this session, um, should we hit some more uh, spaceships? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. do spaceships. Yeah. Why not? Why um, not? I'm going to throw one in of one that I personally like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you know, you guys just throw in one one more, okay, uh, and see how we go. Um, Icarus two, nice, In- interesting choice. Funny you should mention that actually. Yeah, Icarus, yeah. The only problem I have with Icarus two is the mm-hmm. idea of it was to uh, drop the bomb mm-hmm. and then fly back. Yes. Once mm-hmm. the bomb, the bomb is inside the shield. Yes. Once the shield has been released... I can answer this for you now. Yeah, I was It has say. a secondary smaller shield, which when it detaches from the stellar bomb, you see briefly before it blows up. You do, but mm-hmm. then the, the radio antennas would still be gone. This is true. This is true. Because that secondary shield wasn't big enough to hide... The uh, secondary, uh, the you, radio you, you are quite right in that. Yes, a, a whole lot of the whole reason antennas get blown up was sketchy at best. But you are quite right there. Yes, mm. yeah. I it, mean, it's actually less of. I, I think the smaller shield is okay to maintain it. It's more a fact that the deflection it had um, with a big shield, it, it would never have been in any risk. I mean, that sh- stellar bomb was so massive, there was zero chance of any part of Icarus being exposed to the sun. Mm-hmm. It, it, you can could, you could literally go to probably almost 70 degrees deflection without the ship coming into sunlight. 
Uh, but for reasons of plot, they had to lose the radio antennas. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I think that's just more of a... The losing the towers was less realistic than the smaller shield they had for the end bit. Yeah, well, the the, the thing... Also, the thing is with that was was that the towers only get lost when the ship basically is not pointing directly at the sun. As soon as it turns slightly to the angle, the idea was that the shield was to act as a shadow, correct? And so yeah. the point was was that shadow presumably would be a cone that came out and covered the the you know mm. the um the was it the the wheelie the wheelie antennas bit. Yeah. But um as far as it goes, I mean I yeah, the whole thing with Icarus was that when you see it switch across to detach the ships. Oh, what's that? I'm getting it's it's a picture of the Icarus with its smaller shield. Yeah. So that's the smaller shield. And yeah, if if you keep that square onto the sun, the entire ship is okay, but any deflection will cause you issues. Um, which is why if they'd had the problem with that shield and they had to deflect slightly to avoid sunlight, that's fine. Mm. But because they used the stellar bomb, which is that big black thing occupying an entire one half of the screen there, I'll just post this in the chat so everyone else can see it, um, that makes less sense. So it, even if you were to turn the stellar bomb shield, say, to 60 degrees, you'd still be in that cone of the shadow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was more just a, yeah, it was more a plot contrivance than anything. So so what do you like about that ship anyway, Ellen? It looks practical for the, the mission that it was on. Mm. It's there, it's, if you want to put a cue ball into a pocket on a game of snooker, without mm. hitting any other balls, you use the cue and just push it. And that's all it's doing. It's just a long, thin cue pushing that ball to the pocket. Yeah. That's all it is. Mm. And I think it, it's very, very minimalist. Mm. It, it's not uh, over-exuberant, shall we say. Hasn't got massive compartments on it for no reason whatsoever. No. I mean, to be quite honest, it is one of the ships which is probably the most science -y scientifically accurate up to a point i mean the only the only thing that it really kind of fails on is um is the fact that it has artificial gravity and everyone's in the central section yeah mm. but apart from I, that I, I've, got, I've got i've got i've got to be careful because uh again spoiler alert everyone we're doing this ship next ah <laughs> we're doing science ships next okay yeah. which which for the listeners isn't going to be for what about four for weeks month, about four weeks so about in about four weeks times we're doing science ships. Okay, well, I, I, don't want, I, I don't want to cloud your judgment or, or move the judgment. Oh, no, anyway. it's not that. It's just I have defences in place, which I don't want to tip my hand to just yet. Yeah, because <laughs> that's the thing. Once we, once we have our ships in place and we all want to, all our ships to get on the board, then obviously, you know, we'll, we'll put up, you know, the, the ones you can't argue about speed and size and that kind of thing, you know, we'll let those go. But when it gets to sort of like later on, the other, the other, categories when, like when, when, when you get to your realizations and your science and so forth then yeah. then you've got to you've got, you've got, it's like it's like a game of poker you've got to keep your cards close to your chest yeah. okay well then i you don't have to say anything for this but um one of the other reasons why i do like this is because you you got the uh the garden in there as well mm. and it looks so very practical yes yeah that 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 garden is extremely well realized yeah um yeah i mean the i mean it reminds me of um I mean, it, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of ships which have like garden areas for for habitat and generation of food and resources and stuff. I mean, it's the earliest one for that sort of thing is the Valley Forge from um, Silent Running. Yeah, which Ooh, just yes. has those big bug-eyed domes, which uh, Doreen mentioned on Mixler earlier on. Mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's um, yeah, it, that's fantastic. The only thing that fails on is the fact that it's got big glass domes and the spaceship's so far away from any sunlight it's like well where's the light coming from yeah well, but don't, don't they, i mean i they do address like he, he doesn't hear about solar lamps or something in there to deal with that you need a bit more than just a oh i know you need a bit but i'm just saying they at least pay lip service to it don't they yeah yeah but do. uh the icarus too it's like walking into a shop like a bee jams or an iceland where you've got like the 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 refrigerators are all on one wall and you've got all the the grasses and the the, the plants behind that I, I just think it's it's so mm. nasa-esque that mm -hmm. they would keep them in these 
these type of refrigerators. It, 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 it didn't quite have um, DeGrasse Tyson on board, but it did have Brian Cox, his um, British equivalent, if you will, yeah. uh, on board as a science advisor. Um, for, for all the good the pinbacker stuff did, but still. Um, mm. We won't get into that. Say, powder's dry, powder's dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the mass to make a, a stellar bomb big enough, the size of Manhattan would actually two, take... Two, two. Yeah. Yeah. More resources than there is on the entire Earth, but you know. Okay. But then we've we've had things like Darth Vader's Star Destroyer, which also have more resources than several planets to make. <laughs> right. Okay. Five minutes left. Andy, okay. go on in. Yes. Well, Science based ships. Anything you want. Just just another one that you you really really like. Oh, I, I absolutely. Uh, going back to like Star Trek ships. Um, my my favourite Enterprise, just to go back to that, is the refit of the Enterprise. The Enterprise refit. It, it might not be the fastest or the uh, most powerful or the biggest, but it's the best. It's the best proportion. It's the best looking. It was my Enterprise growing up. I love that ship. And no carpets. So, you know, it's win win. <laughs> no static self destruct is a, Self destruct is a little bit iffy, but other than that, you know. <laughs> Very iffy. <laughs> Oh, I've said one, 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 and uh, we're going to what sector? Alpha, self destruct. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm doing my recreation of Shakespeare to be or not to be. What do you mean, what destruct activated? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, f- for me, uh, my my other another one of my favourite ships would be. Um, oh, there's 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 one from the books which I'll leave in case we come back for another another round of this but um there's uh well i mean there's the normandy itself which i love um i'm trying to think there's no there's there's loads of them but i mean i think i guess i guess the millennium falcon i, th- yeah. I think you can't you can't argue with that ship it looks like a piece of junk but it Wait, when fits. you saw it in the force awakens even though we knew it was in there when you see it yeah it's a thrilling moment it's like oh it's the falcon that's so cool and when you hear the engines fire up as well, it's just such a cool moment. And, and we all knew it was there. We, we'd seen it in the trailers and everything. But when you see it for the first time, you literally, your heart was filled with joy. Didn't have yeah. that feeling. You didn't? Didn't have that feeling. Really? Yeah. Are you, you dead did. inside? I, I <laughs> might, maybe when this film is concerned, yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, sad, sad trombone. Um, I mean, the only other, the only other ship I'd say is probably something like, like Thunderbird three, which I love. I think it's a fantastic design. Mm-hmm. Don't go on about it being red rocket, Andy. I've heard enough. Oh, 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 I wasn't going to say anything about it being a red rocket. I was mm. going to compliment its fantastic cloaking device. Oh, get stuff. <laughs> it's not a cloaking device visually. You. Divwit, you even used your, it's the same thing as the bloody Normandy. <laughs> you can't you can just look out of a window and see the blasted thing. <laughs> just you can't actually see it on any radars. Oh. Now now in okay, I'm gonna come to Bat for Lee here for a minute, right? Under our revised scoring system, it makes sense. Because we actually have a category for things like cloaking devices. That's fine. But when we did episode zero. We didn't. We just had an option for firepower. <laughs> and Lee managed to argue that it should have scored. What was it, free? Yeah. I, I think or, or, it was, he managed to argue that an unarmed rescue shuttle should score free for firepower. Which yep. I, I, I got a golf clap. It, 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 it was spectacular reasoning. If, if you haven't listened to episode zero, go give it all a listen because um, yeah. there were some hoops were jumped through, but he stuck the landing. Okay. Yeah. Right, I'm going to cut you off there. Um, are we coming back for one more or a little bit more? If, I'm up for a bit more if, if you want. Okay. If you're willing to listen to it, yep. Okay, right, we'll come back for a little bit more uh, in around about 10, 15 minutes uh, for the people on Mixler. Uh, otherwise, uh, please join us next time if, if we are around uh, on Mixler.com forward slash Rogue 2 Media and we'll be back, yeah, very, very soon, I suppose. Yeah. So, see you later. Tati bye. ta da But it's the simple question of weight ratios, okay? A five pound bird cannot carry a one ounce coconut. It must simply grab it by the husk. Look, it's not <laughs> on that where it grips the bloody thing. It's a quick, simple question of weight ratios. <laughs> what about my. And they don't migrate. What about African swallows? <laughs> well, an African swallow may be, but you know, an African swallow is non migratory. <laughs>
Hello, oh. we're back. <laughs> Good mm. lord. Hello. Yes, we're back again. Uh, Shunky Lab, back on Mixler once again. Um, I'm once again for part three of three because this is it. This is no more. There is no more after this. Uh, three but... being the number of accounting and the number of accounting being three. Oh. <laughs> no. Go to four. Five is right out. I'm joined by Mr. Lee Metcalf. Hello. And Mr. Andy Palastides. Hello. There we go. Right, so what were we going to crack on with uh, this part three of three? Um, I think it was least favourite ships Oof. we were going to start with. Oof, uh, I'm, do you know what? I think we should start with Andy this time. Ooh, least favourite starships. Um uh... I'm going to try and avoid mentioning ones which are just bad because of low budgets and all that. Uh, and, and, and this will probably get me lynched, but I was never a fan of any of the ships from Farscape. Right. To Google? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called the Moya, isn't it? Yeah, Moya and Talon. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, that that was... Yeah. Are, are you with me, Beverly? I'm with you all the way with Farscape. I I yes. never saw the appeal of Farscape. I I could I just couldn't get into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and um yeah, and Stargate SG One. Ooh, some of the shit that used to produce as well was <laughs> bloody awful. I know we're everything has to be Egyptian. Let's put let's put feathers on everything. Fuck off. Okay, now I, I'll save it. I I didn't mind Stargate SG One. However. It it, it 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 was a series that ended, and then kept going, and then they decided when they ran out of the bad guys being these Egyptian gods, which were um, impersonating you know the aliens impersonating Egyptian gods, they decided instead to get these new aliens, who were just mm. impersonating other gods. It was like, oh my god, they're completely different bad guys with a completely different thing, but they're they're they're, they're still pretending to be gods mm. and it, stuff. It's just like. Yeah, uh, it, it it should have ended with them fishing, and I'll leave it at that. It should have ended with the bit where it says Stargate SG One. Um, but anyway, sorry. Yes, but yeah. So 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 the ships from Farscape, and again, I I I think for me it's because I never got into the show. Because because okay, another controversial opinion here: the Serenity is not the best looking starship in fiction such as it is but i have an affinity for the ship because i love the show i love firefly i love the crew so i have a real affinity for the ship although i can acknowledge it is not the best looking ship in the universe whereas with farscape because i never had that affinity with the show or with the crew it just looks like an ugly ship to me so yep there you go fair enough cool lee well um i've got a list i've got a big list um, essentially, I hate any spaceship which which is poorly designed, or in, I mean, I love, I hate pretty much every kind of kit bashed piece of fan wank to do with Star Trek. I love the Jaeger class. No, I just, yeah, I mean, if you look at if you go online and look at any Star Trek ship not designed by the people who make Star Trek. Uh, Egyptians in Vancouver, Jack's just said. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, and you look, you look at like Star Trek fan fan designs. Basically, you've got the most unimaginative human beings on Earth turning around and going, "I know, I'm going to take a saucer, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some engines on it, and then I'm going to put that central bit in it, and it just looks stupid every single time." Mm-hmm. There's, there's never a moment where you sit there and go, oh, do you know what? I could see that in the TV show. You go, no, actually, what you've done there is you've got some graph paper, you cut out a saucer, and then you cut out the Enterprise engines, and then you've turned them upside down, stuck them together, and gone, job done. It's like, no, people are designers and draftsmen and engineers who work all this shit out to make it look beautiful. You know, the Enterprise E is this long, graceful, new design. But you look at anything that someone puts together because they're just wanking about with bits that they've cut up from, like, Airfix models. It's just like, no. Look, Lee, look, look at the last one I sent you. I, I'm looking at it. it just, <laughs> just, that's just 
fucking rubbish. Oh dear. And everything, <laughs> everything that fans, everything that fans put out, is done with love. Don't get me wrong. I'm not Ooh, knocking. I've got a good one here for you. Oh, don't, don't, just don't, because I tell you, it makes me angry. Every single one of them. Oh, fuck off. That's just a <laughs> toilet tube. That's like Mum's first science project, trying to make an enterprise for their science fictiony fan kid. That's just, just that's just cock. That is literally like someone's got a cigar tube and a couple of bits from an AMT Amtil fucking Enterprise model and just gone, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, if I stick that all together, it might look like something. Oh, my God, that's... Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's and that's, not good. It's not good. And I'll tell you what, everything, all of this stuff... It has it, a face on it as well. <laughs> yeah. You can see the face. It's like it's, it's pouting as it's, it's taken its own selfie. <laughs> It's almost it's almost like you can look at it and it's almost going, Kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean it's the uh, Star Trek fan builds are uh, with rare exceptions to a man of the they are absolutely bollocks. Made by idiots. I, I don't I know I know we've always tried to be very careful about not annoying you know, fans. No, they, they, they don't listen to this cast. It's fine. Go but, <laughs> but seriously, seriously, I, I, it just incenses me on a, on a, on a purely on an artistic level. Not even, not even like a liking Star Trek. I just look at it and it just looks lazy. It's mm-hmm. just like someone. It's like there was um, there was a a front cover for a for a a, a, a music of the f- cinema kind of thing. Um, I think it was like a Jeff Last or something like that. You know, one where they do bad covers of, of you know, music from films and TV. And they obviously couldn't get the rights to do Star Trek or Star Wars uh, on the cover. So what they did was they took a picture of the, en- of the Millennium Falcon and then stuck the Enterprise from the neck down on it. So it looked like the Millennium Falcon with the, with the Enterprise sort of just jutting out the bottom. And it was like, okay, I see what you did there, but it looks like shit. And that image comes to my mind every time I see a fan film, a fan built spaceship, and everyone stands there all proud of it. Like, oh, look at this. Oh, yeah, Jack Woodgate goes, yes, the USS Tampon applicator. Um, oh, there you go. Jeff Love and his orchestra. Look at this, right? What he's put in the chat, right? Have a look at that and look what they've done to the Enterprise. To cover it up, to cover I, up. I, I, I'd be more concerned with right. what they've done to. Uh, is, is that Scott or Virgil Tracy in the corner? I don't know. I think he's. I oh, think yeah. he's. Johnny, I think it's Johnny Cab, to be honest. Um, but the, you know, that an eagle transporter behind him. Yeah, except they put a little tinkly nose thing on the end of it, so it's not the same ship. And and they've given Spaceship Five an extra ring. No, Space Station Five, sorry, an extra ring. Yeah. Oh, it's a third ring. Yeah. Yeah. So you get you around it, but that is fan. That is fan art in a nutshell. That's fan designs right there. It's like it's just bollocks. You you know you would never pay. You would never pay a single person to make a spaceship if that's what they had in their portfolio. It's just like you are just a, an unimaginative ass bandit with absolutely zero intelligence or design ethic at all. You just think putting bits from other ships together makes another ship. It's like, no, it just looks like shit. And you're, you should feel bad for me bringing this abomination. Your starship's bad and you should feel bad. Exactly. I mean, as for real design ships that are bad, I mean, there's, there's, the, there's the Cement Horizon, which is <laughs> bloody awful. Uh, because of course, what do we need? We need a cathedral in space because that's what NASA want to do. You know, make a cathedral in space. But not only that, let's make a let's make a, a tunnel to the engine room, which will make people feel fucking sick. <laughs> it's I know, I know. Let's have a tunnel that's constantly. I was, was going to say, I, I, I didn't see any railings around this spiky room, so I think health and safety might have a few words for them. Also, none of those warning symbols with the you know the yellow hazard signs. They, they should have been prominently visible in all those dangerous places. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's just it's just terrible. 
and and there's and then the other one is the Origa from um, Alien Resurrection. Oh, now that is a bad that, that that is a ship which doesn't look the same from any two angles. Basically, they made it. They made it, and then what happened was then they realised about halfway through filming that they had to film it from another angle. Mm-hmm. So they rebuilt the model, and that model looks nothing like the other model. And then they had to film it from another angle, and they did the same again. And then someone else, and then they had to refilm it again. And what they did this time was they made a painting, which was a painting of it against the planet. But not only that, it was a painting against the planet, and it had to make the other three models all fit together. So again, you look at it, and there's no one shot of that ship that ever looks the same. It just looks like... Someone's had a really lot and eaten a lot of roughage and had a really bad shit. I hang about so so. There's a shot of it from the front. Mm. Okay. Yep. Yep. So right now, let me just find the rear angle shot. Ah, there we go. And here's a shot of it from the rear. Mm. Euphemism. Yep. <laughs> yep. Jim. Jim's left. That's it. He's gone. Has, has he gone? Oh, fine. He, he's so up. so. Look at that, Elton. Yep. Does the back of that ship look like it's attached to the front of that ship? In no way whatsoever. No. And, 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 and the, f- the thing is, what's the most tragic here is this is the series which birthed us from the Stromo and to a lesser extent the Sulaku, which were both very well-realised starships that, you know, mm. make sense and look cool and, you know, are iconic. And then you have this, which when Lee mentioned this to me the first time, I had to Google it because I couldn't remember the name of a bloody thing. It was yeah. just like... It meant nothing to us. It looks like a maggot. The first picture you put out, it looks like a maggot with all the it, ridges. It does. You you are absolutely right. And the yeah. little eyes on the front stems. Mm. Yeah, it's just it's just an armoured slug from the front. From the back, it looks like someone stepped on a spaceship with lots of engines. Well, it's like the ones from Starship Troopers from the back, isn't it? Yeah, and it's just it's just a, it's just a catastrophe of design, and it's. I, Again, there's a, there's a shot of it from the side where someone's obviously gone hanging about. These two bits don't fit. Um, let's make a ship where it looks like it fits from the side. And it's just like, hold on, there it is. Yeah, and we can't even make it fit. So I'll tell you what we do. We do it in 99.9% darkness. <laughs> <laughs> it's like That's like taping over all your bad bits of artwork. That's like Tipex. Space Tipex. So, so, so when we get to our episode about throwing your ships under the bus, we know mm. what you're going to go for, yeah? <laughs> you know it. I'm going to kick that thing so hard that even <laughs> the designers will feel it. I mean, seriously. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible design. And, you know, it, that's the thing. I, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've doodled spaceships that look better than that. I, I, feel, I feel sorry for the people who had to work on it. On the other hand, I also feel like, well, you didn't bring your A game, guys, and you know, you didn't. You, no one planned it. It's just awful. No, it, it, it's an afterthought. An, yeah, this is an incident where the, there was there was no design led construction of a ship. You know, no one gave any thought to what anything does. It was just make a big spaceship. I, I mean, I tell you what, Spaceball One has more sense into it than this thing does. Yeah. I mean, the thing with Spaceball 1 is it's supposed to transform into Meter Maid, so there has to be elements of Meter Maid built into it, even if it doesn't work very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hold on, and um, hold on, Jack Woodgate just put up one in the chat that said, here's one from the Star Trek animated series that's stuck in my craw. Um, oh, <laughs> goodness sake. What is that? I mean, <laughs> again, it looks like it just looks like someone started drawing a boat, then got bored halfway through, and then thought, I know, I'll rub this bit out, and I'll rub that bit out. Oh, I've got some nacelle pictures here. I think if I just stick them on the side, that'll be fine. Well, that's what they, they go for. Yeah. If you put them on there, then you're in the Star Trek world. Yeah. I mean, if I had a particularly tough shit and then stuck some nacelles in it, <laughs> I mean, I think that mate, would... mate, mate, I, I, I really, really think you need to go and see a doctor about this. We, we've had this discussion before. See dude, a doctor, dude. If you fold up pizzas on a train and eat it, <laughs> now that's what happens to you. <laughs> but um, what about you, Elton? Have you, have you got any terrible spaceships? 
uh, <laughs> getting away from the poo talk. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I I might be. I'm ready for a kick in on this. <laughs> uh, Flight of the Navigator. Oh. I, I don't like that ship at all. See, Dory mentioned this on the on the on the Mixler chat earlier on. Oh, okay. Um, that she thought the interior was quite nice, you know, the, the the shiny seats and all that kind of stuff. I don't like it. It doesn't look comfortable whatsoever. It just looks like everything is Teflon coated and and everything's Teflon coated, and then you put a teenager in it. That's not good. I'll be honest with you. It does remind me of of someone someone with their, a three D package trying to make a walnut and then using default chrome as their surface. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's not. It's not the most inspiring of spaceships. I'll be honest no. with you. It's um, not. But I, I will. I'll give it a slight pass. Just in that it was what middle of the eighties, like eighty four, was it? Yeah. It yeah. was. It, it, it was pretty groundbreaking effects at the time. I mean, when I saw that when I was a kid, I was convinced they built a real spaceship because I was like, I could. I couldn't see how they couldn't make that real. When it skimmed across the water as well. What well, was that? And when 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 the um. When the steps come out from the back, you know, it kind of it kind of pulls down into the steps. Oh, I didn't like the steps. It transforms into the longer, sleeker version. Um, uh. But yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm not saying it's a good design. I'm just saying I, I'm going to give it a bit of leeway in that very early. I, I don't know if it was CG or model work or what it was, but it was very well done for the time. It was CG. But then, you know, the, the thing with that is even that's not really a super duper excuse because you've got things like The Last Starfighter, which was like the first instance of CG spaceships, as far as I remember. Hang on. I, th- I think I know that ship. The yeah. Gunstar. Gunstar, yeah. Well, while you're looking at that, by the way, if anyone is interested in just seeing nicely designed ships done from imagination by people with a bit of talent, and and they want to see something that isn't a Star Trek, two nacelles, a cylinder that looks like a cigar holder and a, another disc on top, then I would suggest you go to conceptships.blogspot.co.uk. The link is, of which has just appeared in the chat. Yes. As if by magic. As if by magic. Just like that. Just like it, that. Because it, it's just beautiful. And you could end, some of the stuff that's done on that could easily be a nice desktop wallpaper or something like this that. This will eat your... It, it, this is a, this is a site where you go to just have a quick browse, and the next thing you know, it's six hours later, and where the hell has my day gone? Gotcha. Okay, right. I'm, I'm going to drop a couple more in, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, no, by all means. You know, in the prequels of Star Wars, the what? The what? Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Pre- prequels. You know, in the prequels. Yeah, next, next, you'll be telling me there's four Indiana Jones films. <laughs> don't. There isn't. There's five. <laughs> yeah, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't mind the idea of uh, the development of the ships. Mm-hmm. I thought the idea of development uh, wasn't too bad. It was mm-hmm. the way that they did them. And what turned into the TIE Fighter in uh, the uh, Sith movie. The Sith. Yeah. yeah. Didn't like that at all. The um, Jedi Starfighter, is it? Yeah. I I couldn't stand that. I don't mind that so much, but let me let me tell you one of the issues I have, not so much now since it's been expunged from existence, but one of the issues I had with the Star Trek, uh, the Star Wars expanded universe, especially things like Knights of the Old Republic and the Old Republic and those older games, yeah, is the fact that they were implying that six thousand years ago. The bad guys were still flying around in triangle-shaped Star Destroyer ships and all the soldiers were walking around in white plastic armour. Mm-hmm. It, it, it is a society in cultural stagnation where nothing has evolved in the X number of years. It's just... It, it, the, the thing is, and this is probably a completely different chat for the other day, but one of the things that made the original Star Wars film so good is it was a sense of... Nostalgia. It was a sense of implying that things had used to be better than they were now. You know, this whole sense of the old republic was much better than the empire they had now. You know, they used to have elegant weapons from a more civilized age and so forth. Yeah. And then when you got the prequels, it was shown not to be the case. It was shown that actually it was worse than it is now. Uh, 
which kind of undermine a lot of that. And a lot of those designs, I, I mean, there were some nice things in the prequels for ship-wise. I don't mind in Attack of the Clones, I think it is, the big flying chrome wing that Amidala has. Is it Attack of the Clones? That yeah. is in uh, Phantom yeah, Menace the... as well. And... No, no, in Phantom Menace, it's much more of a crew, it's like a pointy nose sort of thing. I quite like, I like the wing one. Um, right. But yeah, yeah. But by, by and large, the prequels, the ship designs, it's it's they're all... They're just rehashing what they've already done in the original films. Mm. Well, it's, which is which? I mean, not to give them an excuse, but basically, what you've got there is you've got someone saying this is where these ships start off and this is where they have to end. So you have to get like vestigial limbs worth of design in there to sort of say, well, this is how it's going to end up, kind of thing. Mm. And and the designer Doug Chang. Um, was was a big Star Wars fan, so unsurprisingly, a lot of the elements try to look like the older Star Wars movies yeah. instead of looking different. And you know, I don't know. I don't know. If it's an excuse, but it, it's something you kind of have to kind of accept, I guess. Yeah, you know, so no, your mileage may vary. Some yeah. stuff I thought in them wasn't too bad. Uh, there was a nice idea. Uh, you know the oh, the the stations. They're on the Phantom Menace outside Naboo. Mm. And they're just orbiting uh, the the trade blockade, basically. Yeah. And yeah. yet they're, they're space stations up there. You know the central orb of that? Mm-hmm. They mm. were seen in Attack of the Clones taking off from the surface. Yeah, that's right. And I'd, I'd, once you grasp that, then you think, oh, hang on. So you had that, and then they decided to get rid of that big half donut around it, and you, I, I just like that touch. I thought that was a great touch. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. There's there's an awful lot. There's, I mean, you know, we're we're ragging on lots of this stuff, and and but the, the design stuff that goes into some of these ships and the thought of it really is quite in depth. I mean, they they literally have to think about everything this ship can do on the off chance that the director and the writer might suddenly turn around and ask them to do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of that stuff, like especially like those Genes- Genosian, tr- you know, control ships, were were really well sorted of thought out. You know, it's only it's only the writing. Again, it's a bit like Prometheus. It's only the writing and the... There's, film- a, there's a school of thought that says, if you watch Star Wars in a different mm-hmm. language, so you, you put it in a different language you don't understand, they're, they're, they're beautiful films to just watch. Mm. Oh yeah, it's the dialogue which fucks them all up. They're great demonstrations for uh, uh, high def TVs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So at, at some points, anyway. Well, yeah. Some of it looks rubbish, but um, yeah, I'm gonna throw one more at you. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's more for the interior than the exterior. The exterior is mm-hmm. not too bad. Do you remember the big? Um, it's pretty much a cruise liner in space from Wally. Yes, the, the Axiom. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's more the interior that I don't like in that. It, you, you're walking in. I know it's made by Disney, but you're walking into an Apple store. Yeah. What is that? I mean, it, it, it is effectively, as you say, it's a cruise liner. Uh, and cruise liners are my idea of hell. Um, yeah. And, and, that, and that's what it is. It's, it's just a, it's, it's a cruise. It, it's not a, sh- it, it, it's just, a, it's a resort. It's a, it's a hotel, it's a holiday resort, isn't it? Well, yeah, for the whole of mankind. Well, not all of mankind, well, not just all, yeah. a large portion of yes. it. But yeah, it, it, it's it's just... Um, I'm with you on that, and it's certainly not a space I'd want to be on. But... And then you've got that stupid bloody captain as well. Flipping. <laughs> I I don't like that movie at the best of times anyway. <laughs> but then you've got them stupid things that are just whizzing around all over the place. Robots left, right and centre. I flipping, flipping hate it. <laughs> really do. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. you've got the stupid captain. Yes, I know. He looks like a will. And the captain looks like a captain. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. A will on our boat. I know that. It Just go away. Just go away. So what we've basically established is actually you just don't like Wally as a film. Oh, he's bobbins. I hate Coming it. up next on the Black Dog podcast. <laughs> no, never, no, actually, you're, you're perfectly safe there. I don't like it at all. I, I <laughs> detest Wally. I absolutely hate it with... It's just so sugary and twee, and and the message is so utterly naive. It's just yeah, the message is just 
delivered with a cattle prod. I can, hate can it. I just, can, I just, can I just steer you both back to the Mixler chat for just a moment? Jack has posted something truly horrifying. Mm. Okay, click hold on. The, click on the picture he's posted. What? On say, what you see, say what you see. <laughs> what the flaming fuck is that? It looks like half-designed Muppet. It's it. I I don't even know how to com- comprehend what it looks. It looks it looks like someone's doing. There's a sh- reason that everyone involved wanted to disavow the animated series, and I think Jack has just posted what that reason is. Well, for those of you who are, who can't see this thing, imagine um, who's Sam the Eagle from um, the Muppets. The Muppets, ha, 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 and it's it's basically his beak. And then the internal structure of his body is, is is showing and the rest of his head has been removed and there's this red bit that may or may not be controlling his eyes. It's just... It's like someone's put, like, two red socks on their hands, like, like sock puppets, mm-hmm. and then crossed their arms over and pretending they're wings while someone else has taken a purple beak... And stuck it on their elbows. It's it's just mind-bogglingly shit. It's not good, if we're honest. <laughs> it's called the Cuckulun. 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 No, Cuckulcan. Cuckulcan. What, what Apparently I, you can't. <laughs> no, Cuckulun bollocks. Cuck old wankfest. What is that? It's just, gee, Jesus, that's just fucking awful. It's hideous, isn't it? Again, back to Star Trek. Star Trek can produce some of the worst spaceships ever. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no. That's just awful. I'm going to go back to looking at concept ships. Yeah, let's go back to concept ship. It's safe here. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's get away from Disco Smiles. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about real spaceships. Like yes, please. Actual ones. Have you guys got a favourite space probe? Because we've sent a fair few out of there and we posted a graphic earlier. So, Elton, what's your favourite real spaceship? Well, I off the chat, uh, I did say Voyager 1 just for the historic uh, sentiment that it, it contains. Um, yes. It will be it, there. It just, it's going to say, Voyager 1, unless we do invent some method of faster than like technology will always be the furthest object away from mankind. Mm. Made by man, yeah. Made by man, yes. Um, it, it's always going to be there until the end of time. Mm. And I, I love that. Or until some fact. angry Klingon blows it up. Yeah, or it drops into a black hole or something like that. But then again, look, mankind has sent something to a black hole. Excellent. Yeah, um, there was... was uh, what was the one around Saturn... Recently, uh, Cassini. Cassini was Saturn. Galileo was Jupiter. Uh, mm. I think it was uh, Cassini, uh, and it dropped a probe down onto Titan. That was Cassini, it. yes. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I found it, and it dropped Huygens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which was the lander. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He, he, is it Huygens or Huygens? Uh, Huygens. Huygens. Okay, there you go. But um, yeah, Cassini is the only um, ship which actually took a photograph of every person on Earth waving at it. Um, basically, um, when because I went to um, a presentation which had Brian Cox hosting and, and Robin Ince, and one of, the to- one of the chats by one of the guests was actually the lady who's in control of Cassini and the f- photography and the you know the time on the camera and everything, and she was doing all these presentations. And apparently, what they did was they set up a time, and they put it on Twitter on NASA's Twitter and said, "At this time of day, GMT adjust for time." Obviously, mm-hmm. Cassini will look back at the Earth and take a photograph, and we want you to all be standing there waving up <laughs> at the sky. <laughs> And and apparently, there's you know they got thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs of people sort of taking photographs of them waving at the sky, and so apparently, 
it holds the world record for the photograph with the most people waving in it. Wow. I didn't even hear about that. Didn't you? Oh, we, yeah. I don't think you can beat, though, for pictures of Earth. Mm. It's not a fantastic picture of the Earth, but it's the pale blue dot picture. Yeah. That is, mm. for me, one of the single most powerful images ever captured by mankind. It's, mm. it's such a viscerally powerful image. And, and I think speaks to one of the reasons why I love spaceships so much. This sense of there's more out there. There's, there's, there's so much more than what we have here. And uh, I, I don't know if anyone's seen the picture. Let me just see if I can find a thing. Well, Cassini did a pale blue dot version. Where they it, had... it did a version, but like I said, it wasn't the pale blue dot. It wasn't. I mean, the reason the pale blue dot was so powerful was Voyage 2 was out past Saturn. It, it left the solar system effectively, I think. It was Voyager uh, 1. No, it was Voyager 2 took the picture, I think. Voyager yeah. 2 took the picture um, because it, it, it had done the thing. There you go. I found a picture of it. But what they did was they turned Voyager around and took this picture. They took a picture of all the planets in the solar system. But what they did... Oh, no, you were right. It was Voyager 1. I stand corrected. In 1990. But it managed to catch this single pixel, which was the Earth. And uh, Carl Sagan gives this beautiful little um, monologue talking about how this one blue dot contains everyone who's ever lived, everyone who's ever loved, every dictator, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint, every sinner, everyone is this mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And it was just such a viscerally powerful image. And I think that for me is it's one of the reasons I love space so much. But it's also one of the reasons I love spaceships. It's that sense that I want to get out and I want to see the pale blue dot for myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Cool. Well, yeah, that, it, 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 it is such a powerful uh, shot. Uh, I, mm. I do remember hearing about this when they wanted to do it. I'm sure it was on um, oh, the night sky, night sky or something like that. Well, I'll yes. tell you what. It, sky, it, it, at if night. I, sky at night, even. Let me mm. post this here because I, I know Lee can play this. That, that's Carl Sagan giving his speech about it. What, you want me to play it? No, I'm just saying if, if, if you want to, it's there sort of thing. But that is a very powerful image with a powerful little chat from Carl Sagan mm. explaining why it's so powerful. I will stick that on the end of this episode. Mm. Stick yeah. it on. It's a great way to sign off, that is. Yeah. yeah. I'll stick it on there. But yeah, I, I mean, for me, my favourite real ship, such as it were, um, it's the Saturn V. The Saturn V, uh, the Apollo missions, basically. There was, they didn't go as far as Cassini or Voyager or anything like that. They only went as far as the moon. But it was the sense of being able to go from making a commitment that we will go to the moon in this decade and bring a man safely back to Earth to building this. It, and I believe it's still the single most complex machine ever devised by man. It's the Saturn V. It's such a powerful, a powerful rocket. You know, it, it's still today with the new uh, uh, Orion Thing. They're looking at the Saturn V engines as possible bases of what to build because they got it so right straight out of the gate it, it with those big F1 engines. And you know, it, it was a little bit before my time, but when you see the videos, especially in like Apollo 13 of that thing launching, you see all the ice cascading down of it as mm -hmm. all the different sections go off. I mean, that's just... It gets bigger a, and bigger and bigger. It is. It's just such a fucking cool spaceship. Um, and it, it, it's this thing. It's the size of like a... It's 112 feet tall, I think it is. This thing's like a, I don't know, a 12 story building to launch something the size of a VW Beetle. You know? Mm. I mean, it's wasteful as fuck. But you just got to love that, love that ambition. It's the sense of, yeah, we're going to, we're going to go and do it. And they did it, which was just fucking cool. You know, and I wish we had that sense of being able to do stuff like that today, sort of thing. You know, it's, um, I, I, I think we as a species have lost that drive to go and do things like that now you know yes there's other priorities and all that but slight tangent but the shuttle was a mistake in my opinion we should never have bothered with the space shuttle it was expensive for what it did we're only just now kind of picking up the lessons we learned from the Saturn 5 so we're 30 years behind where we should be for space exploration mm -hmm. well it was the 80s though you know you had the star wars projects that they wanted to bring out as well mm -hmm. and it was all bravado and look what we can do we're making they wanted it to look like a plane as well. Well, a, a lot of it was the uh, the US Air Force wanted to be able to spy on the Russians and insisted that the shuttle had wings. 
so it could f- glide back over Russia. Yeah. I mean, his sister, did it be able to launch from Kennedy to launch their own things? And then after everything was signed off and they got along, they changed their mind and decided to use satellites and the Blackbirds instead. <laughs> so they just stuck with his things, like going, the fuck? <laughs> But yeah, I think you're right. We 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 have actually lost the drive for that sort of thing, mm-hmm. uh, which is it's such a shame. Um, Ma- I'd like to say, imagine where we would be. We'd probably still be where we are now, but getting ready to go to places. I um, think I, th- I think if we'd have carried on the progress we'd had from the Saturn missions throughout the eighties and nineties. I, I think it's realistic to expect we would ha- we'd have some sort of presence on the moon, like a permanent presence, or we'd at least been back there since. Um, and, and I think we'd have certainly have had space stations before the International Space Station uh, went up, uh, something like that. I, I mean, a lot of the problem is we don't have the infrastructure to get into space cheaply, and that's only just now starting to happen with things like SpaceX and uh, what what is the Amazon blokes one? Blue Origin, is it? That yeah. sort of stuff, you know. It's, it's just the, the uh, only, only those are just starting to get us to a point where we can go up to space and come back for slightly less. I mean, and, until we get something like space elevators, I always think it's going to be somewhat expensive to do that. But that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> Jeez, space yeah. elevators. How many times have I spoken about them? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, Dor- Doreen has a soft spot for Beagle 2, yeah. But the little probe that almost did. <laughs> yeah, Beagle 2. It... um. It was the British space program, wasn't it? It yeah. was a British probe. Well, British design probe, yeah, but it was a European mission, I believe. Yeah. Uh, sent up uh, to Mars to land. Mm-hmm. It, it had a microphone on it as well. It was going to record what it sounds like on Mars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that was the idea. It was the idea was to do, to do a lot of these things. On thing. and, and, and it was, it was that, one of the main things was it was done on such a cheap budget, comparatively speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but a, a lot of people forget just how treacherous it is to get to mars i think yes we've sent more probes to mars than almost anywhere else but we've also lost more to mars because it's a very narrow window to get the landings just right mm. uh, but i'll tell you what we've got to take a moment to just acknowledge we've got to take a moment to acknowledge the opportunity rover on mars which was sent up for a 90-day mission in 2007 i believe no no 2003 i think it was yeah 2003 it's still going today. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. launched in 2003 for 90 days, and it's still going today. They there, do not build those fuckers like they used to. There was another one that got stuck in the sand, there was wasn't Spirit. there? Spirit. Yeah. There was Spirit, which got stuck, uh, but Opportunity is still going strong. And Curiosity is still up there as well. Curiosity, uh, the, the uh, probe with a, um, a nuclear reactor... I love that comic from XKCD, which pointed out that Mars is the only planet we know of entirely inhabited by robots. <laughs> yeah, how yeah. cool is that? Yeah, I also like. I also like with um with the 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 small the small bit of um thing with Curiosity, which is which is, always comes up around about sort of June. It goes, if you ever feel alone, just remember that every June twenty fourth, Curiosity sits on Mars and plays Happy Birthday to itself. Oh, that's just hard. It does. It's a little, they, 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 it plays a little happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to curiosity. Happy birthday to Oh, that's just, oh, that's just, oh, that's, I feel bad for it now. <laughs> have, you, have you guys seen the, um, the XKCD comic about spirit? No. It, it's going to make you cry. Hang on, let me just find it. I'll stick it in the chat, and uh, I'm sure Elton can pop it in the old um, thing when he posts it. But have a look at this. It'll make you sad. Make you sad. Oh. Oh, God. Right, yeah. Now, that's... that's Yeah, 89 days to go. Two days till I come home. Well, maybe I didn't do good enough. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Guys? Guys? Oh, that but, is... But, but don't worry. I'll, I'll cheer you up, because here's the opportunity one. Okay, the opportunity one is um, six years spirit is down, but opportunity is still going strong. That's in 2010. Tough little rover, 2015. 11 years, wow. Wasn't the original mission 90 days? This is starting to get weird. 2023. The battery is totally disconnected. How come it's still moving? Wait, what did we get? What 
given what it did to the Mars 2020 rover, we may never know. <laughs> 24, 2450, Mars Terraform, Terraform Mars, Martian Imperial Capital. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. What's that dark area? That's the opportunity half of the planet. We must never go there. <laughs> <laughs> If you hover the mouse over it, there's like hidden text and it goes, um, we all remember those famous first words spoken by an astronaut on the surface of Mars. This is one more small step for, holy shit, look out, it's got some, some kind of drill. Get back to the unintelligible signal lost. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> if we go back to the um, uh, the the chart of the cosmos yeah. that we, we got, if you go mm -hmm. to... Can you find box number eight? Box number eight. I have box number eight in front of me, yes. Orbiters of the Sun. Yes. Pioneer five. Mm -hmm. It's like a death head moth. I was actually going to say, it reminds me of the Imperial Interrogation Droids from uh, New Hope. <laughs> it is very similar, yes, but it has got a slight skull to it. Are we it the does. bad guys? I think it. I think that might be the bad guy one, yes. <laughs> Wait, maybe mm. that's what fucked up the sun in uh, in sunshine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Oh, yep. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's right. Uh, have we got anything else to um, add to this conversation of uh, spaceships or space technology or anything like that at all? Oh, well, we, we we could keep going all day, but we have a podcast to do that on, so yes. <laughs> we probably should let people um, uh, get on. <laughs> okay, uh, then. Yeah, I, I've got nothing. I've got nothing further to add, Your Honour. Okay, then. Well, I, I'll tell you what. We'll wrap it up here for now. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us, especially the people in the the Mixler room. Thank mm. you, everyone. Um, yep. Would you two like to plug away again, please, if you don't mind? Um, Andy. Well, uh, you you can hear us on a pokey little space uh, uh, podcast called Space Doc Jury, which you can find at spacedoc.geekplanetonline.com, and also on iTunes and on Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Space Doc Jury, where we talk about um, space spaceships basically and stuff to do with spaceships and any old random stuff we get onto there's myself mr medcalf and uh the right honorable reverend peter organ of the broadcast a bit sick at the moment he's a bit sick he, he's gearing up for a busy week at work so i hear yeah <laughs> his boss is coming back apparently so he's got to look busy <laughs> yeah so he's got to get some chocolate eggs and get the carpenters in yeah mm. sorry no more nails no more nails stop it <laughs> what <laughs> Right, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us in the Mixler. Everyone who's listened to this, everyone who's downloaded this, people in the Mixler, you still don't get out of it. You still have to download this. That is the law. I will be checking on each and every one of you. There's no mm. excuses. Um, can I just direct everyone to the either the Shonky Lab homepage, which is shonkylab.rogue2.com. Uh, also, we've got a Facebook page where you can uh, join in all the discussions. I think, because we've had a, a little discussion off air, the next episode might be called uh, Before the Internet. Mm. So if anyone wants to join me, let me know. You're more than welcome to, to come on and we can well, talk about... an elegant weapon of a more civilised age. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyone's welcome on to, to talk about Before the Internet. So um, I do need someone to, to bat off. <laughs> shall we say wait wait let's rephrase that <laughs> <laughs> oh what a way to close um yes uh head over to facebook.com uh slash groups slash shonky lab and you can find all the details there and there is also a patreon page up and running so you can all dive over there as well um so i think we're gonna leave you with carl sagan and his uh um uh, speech about the voyager one i suppose it was wasn't it Mm. Yes, the pale blue dots. Okay, cool. We'll we'll close with that. And uh, I would just like to say before the end, uh, please leave quietly. This is a residential area. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it... Everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of 
every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.